Today on The Grave Talks, a conversation about investigative techniques and hauntings in Milwaukee with Paranormal Investigators of Milwaukee. Paranormal Investigators of Milwaukee, also known as PIM, was founded in 2007 by Noah Lee. They conduct investigations in private homes and businesses that report supernatural activity using a scientific method in an attempt to separate the explainable from the unexplainable, making sure their conclusions are supported by evidence. They've investigated some of America's most notorious locations, applying their particular scientific rigor to places that have become shrouded in mystery, and sometimes that mystery can be easily debunked. Today on The Grave Talks, we discuss investigative techniques and hauntings in Milwaukee with Noah Lee, founder and lead investigator, and Gravy, lead investigator with Paranormal Investigators of Milwaukee. So today I'm joined by Noah Lee, founder and lead investigator at the Paranormal Investigators of Milwaukee, and Gravy, that's just one name, Gravy. Correct. Yes. Also, you said by default, a lead investigator because you've been there for a while. Now, Noah, you started the team in 2007? Yeah, that's correct. That's a long time. Yes, it is a long time, and Gravy can attest to that. I was I, The group existed before Gravy was in it. Gravy still says it's been an awful long time in PIM, so... But we've um, and by PIM, that's Paranormal Investigators in Milwaukee. Yes, okay. Paranormal Investigators in Milwaukee, absolutely. We've grown a lot in that time, though. In our from when I started to the group to where we are now is is miles apart. And what prompted you to start a group? My, I always love to know what people's background is and your connection to the paranormal. So somewhere, sometime, you became fascinated with it enough to where you started your own team. Yeah, so it, it stems from my childhood and, and not an experience, which I know a lot of people get into this based off an experience. I never lived in a haunted house. I never had you know, anything happen to me, but I was always fascinated by the stories. And I grew up pre-internet, so I you could just Google some story or look for haunted places in your town like you can now. Uh, I, I had to really rely on my school library and my local library for any sort of uh, books or stories that might be about where I lived. And so around Halloween time, I always loved like the spooky shows that would come on and the books that would put out at the library, you know, as special exhibits that they would put out for, for that time of year. And I would always read those books. And when I was um, in high school, I was in cross country and we used to run uh, hill workouts at a cemetery. And there was a, a claim that I heard about at that cemetery. And so one day after I got done with the workout, I ran over to find this grave um, where supposedly there was a, a man that was buried there that was murdered by his wife because he cheated on her. And supposedly the the gravestone, it was like above ground sarcophagus and it had a lid on it and the lid had a hand holding a dagger and uh, it was recessed. So uh, recessed in the lid. And the claim was that when, uh, when it rained, that the blade of the dagger would bleed. And that was because, you know, she supposedly killed her husband. And so what I went is I went and looked. It had rained the night before. So I'm like, okay, let me see if I can see any sort of thing that's going on. And what I found is there was water that collects in that recessed area. And when the water uh, hit the stone, there was iron oxide uh, in the stone. So the stone was... Uh, had quartz in it. And often with quartz, you have iron oxide. So what was happening is when it rained, uh, the water was reacting with iron oxide. And as we know, uh, that creates rust. And so because we have rust, that can kind of give the water that kind of ruddy, orangish, reddish color, which kind of explains why people thought that the blade was bleeding. So that was kind of my first foray into doing a paranormal investigation, although very uh, <laughs> with no controls and uh, all by myself. But you debunked um, and- it. So. I debunked it. I was like, oh, this is, it, but it was disappointing to me at that time, right? Like for me, I'm like a high school kid thinking, oh, this would be so cool if this is real. Uh, but I figured, you know, I, at that time, even I was, my brain is thinking, well, how, what are possibilities? What are the things that could explain this? Cause I didn't want to be duped, you know, I didn't want to be taken in. And so that, that's what I figured out. 
So then I moved on to college, very haunted college is always at Ripon College, very old college and all colleges almost have a story. <laughs> but then I moved to Milwaukee for graduate school and I had a lot of time in my hands. And that's when the show Ghost Hunters came out. And that was my first kind of clue that people did this in any sort of fashion that was organized, like formed a group and went out and investigated claims of the paranormal. And again, before the internet uh, was when I first started looking into this. And then it's because of that show combined with my schedule at school that allowed me to have a lot of time. I wasn't married at the time, you know, kids, no kids, all that sort of stuff. So I could, I had a lot of free times on my hand. I thought it'd be so neat to go out and do this. And so I, I started up with a group um, that was just forming at the time. And I worked for them for about a year. And so my background's in science. And I had graduated from Ripon with a, a bachelor's degree in biology. And then I went on for my first master's at the Medical College of Wisconsin to get a degree in epidemiology. And that's what I was studying at the time that I started doing this. And so in epidemiology, you learn how to design a study. How do you design an experiment to figure out and get uh, an answer at the end of it that is going to be ju justifiable and verifiable? And you can defend it to other people. And so when I was working with this group, they were doing a lot of things that I thought were confounding or biases that were making that investigation worse and harder to justify. And so after working with them for a year, I thought that I should strike out on my own and try to do a more scientifically based group that I felt would be more, better use of my time and really apply that as much as I could to the field of paranormal investigation. So that's why I formed PIM in 2007. I could see where some people get into this just for the excitement of finding stuff and telling the stories like, oh, and then we went here and we saw this and that mm -hmm. and not so much. You know, a lot of people I talk to are about debunking it and, you know, the scientific method. You're not always going in there for the we found all this stuff because that's kind of how you see it on TV. Yeah. And Every so, place you go is haunted, apparently. You know, it's, when you're on a TV it seems show. and really scary. <laughs> At Gravy, how did you get started with your interest in the paranormal? Well, my story is much shorter than Noah's. Mine begins with uh, Unsolved Mysteries from when I was a child watching all those, and I was always fascinated by the ghost stories. I just enjoyed those the most. I, too, did not ever have an experience that really got me into this. Uh, but it was sparked back in, I would say, about 2008, 2009, when Ghost Hunters was making it big on television on the sci-fi channel. Uh, I started watching that and then got intrigued in it. And one night my wife goes, hey, there's a group down at the Brown Deer Library doing a presentation on the paranormal. You should go. So I call up my buddy, Tony. We go down there and that's when I first laid eyes on Noah. And it was like, you know, love at first sight. Aww. I had to be in this group really badly. Tony actually joined the group, and then about a year later after that, I had signed on as well, and the history is there. And today we're primarily talking about the Milwaukee area, but I was looking at your website. You've done investigations over a pretty wide area. Like, I saw some in Kansas, Atchison, which is a very haunted little city in Kansas, but into Ohio and Illinois obviously Wisconsin. So you've been a lot of different places. Yes. Yeah. So we like to go out and we, we look at the TV shows and see the places that they go. And we see the stuff that they claim to happen there. And we like to go and apply our methods to the same locations and really get our eyes on them, get in the buildings, get in, get in the, the areas where the activity is supposed to happen to really get a first person experience there. So that when you have these quote unquote famously haunted locations in the U.S., we can speak from intelligent stance and say, I've been there. I've seen the condition of that location. I know the issues that you're going to run into if you do an investigation. And some, you know, some of the very simple claims like noises being heard or scratching or growls. If you've never been there before, you're like, wow, well, how could that be? Because you're thinking that this is a, a building like any other building that you might walk into. But in often cases, that's that's not the case. And so we like to go to those spots we call them expeditions that we go on and we rent them out so that they're only us and we have no other contaminating factors we have to worry about other than what might be in the environment. And then we go and try and replicate and debunk, you know, claims at those locations based off what maybe TV shows, maybe what other teams have done um, and, and, and document if there is anything there to document. So 
Um, yeah, we've, you know, I think we've gone as far as 12 hours from our kind of home base um, out to Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia area. Um, but we, you know, between, you know, six and eight hours, we've, we've hit pretty much everything in that range from, from the Milwaukee area. And I, I want to expand on that. Uh, we had an incident where we were at Mansfield Reformatory, the same uh, prison where Shawshank Redemption was shot at. We were there and we had an incident where we we're in this room where a rock hit a metal stairwell that was right next to us or a staircase. And at the time we were really intrigued, like, oh, where did this rock come from? We just walked in here and all of a sudden you hear it hit it and bounce kind of roll towards us. And so we were there on short time. So we moved on and did other stuff. But then um, there was a TV show that has a really, um, there's an investigator that we're not really big fans of because of how he does things, but he was there and had a similar situation in the same room happened to him. And we were upon our return to that location, we investigated further on how that rock had happened to us. Same thing happened to him. And we noticed that because this building is not climate controlled, the concrete, the, the ceiling that is made out of concrete was actually crumbling. And so it was, it was rocks and pebbles chunks of stone falling from that and hitting the metal staircase but on the tv show oh. they told you hey this was thrown at me because that's what makes tv interesting but really in real life it was just pebbles falling from it but it did make for great tv because like aha look this is a haunted place they're throwing rocks at us what they need exactly. is a tv show of us going around showing people <laughs> what really happens on tv the great debunkers or something like that when you go in to investigate, because when I was looking at your site and you have a lot of different locations listed on there, you can click on them and you have a very detailed investigation. You can read the notes from the investigation because especially, you know, with your scientific background, you probably take the same approach to each location. Uh, yes and no. I mean, we okay. try to. <clears throat> a procedure is important when you're doing things. There's definitely certain things we do at each location. But some locations require different steps depending on, you know, what you're working with and what the claims are. And so, but that is part of the process that has, we've kind of developed over the years as far as when you go into location, what do you do? What's the first thing? What's the second thing? What's the third thing? Or what's the list of things that we need to get done before we even start investigating? And that list is actually pretty long <laughs> um, so that we're actually prepared to do the investigation by the time um, we start. But yeah, there are certain, you know, baseline readings that we do. Um, you know, we take a lot of pictures of the location um, for documentation purposes. And, you know, then just figuring out where we need to put the equipment. And uh, and there's a lot of work that goes into before we arrive based on those claims. You know, do we need specific gear? Um, do we need specific trigger objects that we want to bring with based on claims? Like, well, so-and-so says that they don't like religious objects here, so let's make sure we have those with us. Or, um, you know, someone was hung here, so we do, do we need to make sure we have a noose with us to use that as a trigger object? So those sorts of things go into before our investigation. And then when we get there, we kind of have our, our checklist to get through uh, before we start investigating directly and then go through the process of the investigation which will include a debunking session usually if we have claims that we are we find can be debunkable and i saw that all of and it seems like oh, i didn't look at every single case but you <laughs> do a con, um a control silence which i thought is a really brilliant idea where you just sit in the space for a certain amount of time and you just listen to the natural sounds that might be in the building and and the now and the sounds that you make as a person, you'd be True. surprised. Yeah, you'd be surprised if you just put yourself in a dark closet late at night and just sit still and just try to listen to stuff. You're going to hear yourself breathing. You're going to hear your stomach gurgle. You're going to hear all these noises that you make as a human being. And it's really important to understand that because a lot of times people capture audio that is really just their stomach growling. And that's why we wear what we call control recorders. We wear them on our person. So if we do capture that sound or we do hear something and we hear our stomach gurgle, we just say, that was me and tag it. That way later in review, we don't mistake in that as, you know, a demon saying, get out of here, you know, because our stomachs, our bodies, as human beings, we make a lot of noises. And so sitting in control silence, we're able to 
say, oh, well, that was gravy. He had Taco Bell for dinner, so we're going to be hearing <laughs> that all night long. Or you should have ate. Your stomach's yeah. going to be growling like that all night. Yep. I think that's a really good idea. And you also get kind of the sounds of the building settling. You know, in my house, every every home has sounds associated with it, the branches on the screen. It, you know, so there's just things like that that you're going to hear that you might go, oh, that's paranormal. No, it's really not. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, especially when you're in buildings that you're not familiar with, right? So in your house, you're probably used to the noises. But when you first move into a house, you're not. And exactly. so you're trying to figure out, well, what is that noise? What is that? And that's like us every time we go to a location. It's like, okay, I've never been here before at this time of day. Or even if you have been, you could have been there 200 times. But who says that the temperature was the exact same? The weather outside was the exact same. You know, the people who were in there before you were the exact same. So that when, as that house is cooling down or warming up, depending on what the time of year is, uh, you know exactly how that house is going or that building is going to respond. And that's really what we're trying to figure out, you know, so that when we ask a question that there's a, a pop that happens to seemingly correspond with that question, um, we can say, oh, that was a paint chip falling or, oh, that was just, you know, the the windows contracting because they have metal frames and that, that was on the west side of the house. And so as the sun set, you know, those are the last ones to cool down. Those are the sorts of things that you learn over time, but that that control silence is critical as in it, and we do it first time we're in each space that we're investigating. So they really can just get used to what those noises could be. Now, I do want to talk about specific locations in a few minutes, and I want to talk about some where you have found some really interesting findings and maybe some that were supposedly, you know, everybody's heard about hauntings there, but you didn't encounter anything. So I'd kind of like to hear those stories. But I want to ask you first about you do paranormal investigations in private homes. Do you do a lot of those? Do you have people reach out frequently that are like, my house is haunted. And and when that does happen, it's pretty much for confirmation, I'm going to guess. What do you find is the kind of the lowest common denominator when people are reaching out to you? I think it, it, they do fall into two camps. There are people who are looking for confirmation of what they've probably already determined to be true. And then there's other people who are just legitimately scared about what's going on. The contacts we get nowadays, a lot of them are dealing with like the blink or ring cameras. Because a lot of people don't understand how night vision works and um, they get motion activated things that happen on their cameras. And so they think, well, something must have tripped it. Uh, but bugs and and even weather can trip those things. And as someone who has those cameras, I've seen it. Uh, but they you know, look at it and think that that's something paranormal. So we get sent a lot of that stuff like, hey. Uh, I caught this on my ring camera or I caught this on like my nanny cam for my, you know, my baby's room. And I don't know what it is, you know, look, I'm freaked out. And so they get scared about that. And so we you know, talk to them about how infrared light works and how dust works and air currents and things like that. And, um, and explain those sorts of things. We get contacted, I mean, less, less than we used to, but we also do less residential investigations than we used to as well. And that's, that's because of, just the experience that we've gained over the years of explanations for what people are experiencing in their homes that allows us to kind of talk them through that over the phone versus having to physically go there and see the space and then and then go through the process. Um, we do do still do some investigations that we don't that are residentials that we don't think there's actually anything going on, but the people are so scared. Um, and, and if there's children involved, then we do do those sorts of investigations to kind of give them that peace of mind. You know, we don't cut any corners. We still go through our process just in case we're wrong. You never know. Uh, and we use the opportunity to educate and show, you know, oh, you claim that, you know, this picture was taken here and there was a demon behind you or, you know, a weird looking thing behind you. Well, we replicated that and, and here's how we did it. And this is what that actually is to try and show them that, like, look, I understand that you're scared and that's very real. But, you know, we can show you the same exact thing and it's very innocuous and that makes people feel a lot better. That's like a wonderful public service. Actually, you're really helping. These are people who are legitimately frightened. Yeah, absolutely. We we take it as you know, we're a 5013C nonprofit through the federal government for education. And so we see it as part of our duty um, to the public when we get reached out to to try and help them in that manner. Not everyone is willing to be want to hear what we have to say, and that's their right. 
we feel this is us doing our due diligence in that in that part of our 5013C nonprofit status. Okay, without giving any addresses or names, have you gone into any private residence where you are all as a group like this? This house is really dark. It's there's something going on here. Have you experienced that? I can honestly say on my personal experience, no. Good. Um, we go in there with an open mind. And I, I personally, I do not watch scary movies for the sake that when I do go into places, I don't want to have my imagination running wild and freaking me out. So I go in there with an open mind and I, and I don't really feel like any of the claims have been the claims of the paranormal from these people and from my own experiences. Have I, do I feel like there's something out there that can physically hurt me? So when I go into these locations, I am not too worried about any such event happening to myself. And just from experience of doing it for so long, we, we like to call ourselves skeptically optimistic in that, yes, there's something out there that we may not be able to explain. We're not entirely sure. And so when we go into these locations, we go in there with an open mind that, hey, yes, this could be the time something does happen. We may capture something or most likely we'll go in here. We'll find answers to everything. and We'll be able to help these people out and help them understand what really is going on in here. And Noah, have you been at any private homes where you did feel like I'm getting ready to confirm this with the people who live here? Not paranormal. No, Uh, I have been in some private homes where I was uncertain of the structural integrity and or cleanliness that I was concerned about, like asthma attacks or bed bugs or scabies or, you know, there's there's those concerns. But I've never had a problem where I was like, oh my gosh, this place is just crawling with something paranormal. And that's usually because there's not like doors opening and closing or furniture moving around by themselves or anything like that when you walk into a place. Um, They just don't look like the, I guess, like a haunted house, how you, how you imagine it in your head. And so you don't go to that space. And like Gravy said, we have to be, we're always open-minded to the pos all possibilities, but the evidence has to support any conclusions that we make. And so, you know, if we do an investigation and we, nothing happens, I mean, we can't say that a place isn't haunted because a negative isn't a result, but we also can't say it is, you know, so it's really at the end of the day, letting the evidence that we capture lead us to our conclusions Mm -hmm. and making sure that our conclusions are supported by that evidence and then ensuring that our investigations are properly prepared and our and we understand our equipment and where to put it and how it works so that when we are going through that evidence review and and coming to those conclusions that we can be confident about them and we can defend them if necessary um if other people have other questions co- to challenge you know our conclusions and i would think that would give people some peace of mind because if you think you're living in a haunted house and somebody comes in and it's like they could explain some of the things you might be able to live there more comfortably. One case like that in um, Racine, where we went down, we investigated it. They had picture pictures that would fall off the wall. They had they had a situation where they would go into the bathroom in pairs. Somebody would shower while somebody sat in there because uh, they had an incident where the faucet turned on on its own. And then there was another incident where they had a scented one of those plug-in Glade scented items that would. That would, yeah, the fresheners that would fall out of the socket. We went in there and we really just debunked all three of those situations uh, with them. And when we, when they came back and we told them, hey, this is what we found, we had nothing happen to us, we reviewed the evidence, there was, we didn't capture anything. And once we explained to them what was really going on, they were ecstatic because they were ready to move out. They were ready to leave the house. But once we told them what was really going on and how these things were occurring, they were ecstatic. They they were even trying to throw us money and we don't accept money for our <laughs> investigations, but that's how excited they were. It's like you can donate to the 501c3 if you'd like to. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's always an option. But, right. <laughs> but we don't charge for our investigations that, you know, when people call us for help, it's only for public events that we're doing as actual fundraisers, just so, so that's clear for everybody. Let's talk about some of the haunted locations that you've investigated and you have been all over, but we can kind of focus on the Milwaukee area. I think Milwaukee, by the way, is an incredible city. I've been there a few times to watch um, 
the Cubs play because I'm a baseball fan. And so I'll go catch a game in Chicago, then go catch a game in Milwaukee. And it's a great city. But there's a lot of history in that city. There are some places that are kind of legendary haunted locations in Milwaukee. And have you had the opportunity to investigate many of those? There are of, if you Google, you know, haunted Milwaukee, there's definitely some places that will show up on a number of lists that you're looking for. Um, unfortunately, some of the more famous ones, or I must say famous, but you know, well-known they they have a, a policy that doesn't allow an, a private investigations to occur. So it makes it makes it hard for us to try to confirm or deny, if you will, um, the stories, things like the Fister Hotel, things like uh, the Rave, things like the Paps Mansion, all have claims, uh, all very old, and uh, all have had documented deaths occur in them. However, it's uh, it's difficult for us to draw any conclusions if we can't apply our investigative techniques to the location. But there are ones that we have been able to investigate. We've investigated the Riverside Theater, for instance, which is a very historic theater here in Milwaukee. We also investigated, uh, it's a bed and breakfast now called the Brumder Mansion, uh, which was uh, a residence originally and then turned into a number of different things throughout its history and now is a, a bed and breakfast here in Milwaukee as well, where uh, you know we've done a number of investigations and have public events as well. So let's start with that Riverside Theater, because I am very interested in haunted theaters. Yeah, we've investigated, I think, three or four times, at least three times that we've investigated the Riverside Theater over the, not recently, unfortunately, because there were some changes in management and whatnot makes it, it's it's a popular theater that still books a lot of shows. And so it's hard to find the time when you can get the space to yourself. Right. Uh, and so, uh, so we always love to go back in. And if anyone from the theater listens to this, please contact us. Um, Let him but in. yeah, we've investigated a number of times and uh, we've had, we've captured a few things, you know, there's, there's always seems to be a claim of the, the, the light booth, something going on in there. And that light booth is actually very historic. It's, there's signatures up there from some very famous musicians and performers uh, that have performed there over the years. And there's the claim, um, supposedly, that one of the operators passed away from a heart attack in that space. They will play tricks on people because it's uh, it's very top of the theater. You have to t- go up lot, lots of flights of stairs in order to access it. And so at the end of the night, the claim is that when they're shutting off the lights in the house, They'll then notice that the light is on up in the in the light booth room, and they'll have to climb all the way back up there to turn it off when they swear that they did already do that. So that's that's one of the claims. And then um, the other major claim is footsteps walking across the stage, which I think also is somewhat of a common one for theaters. Yeah. People who have performed there in the past who passed away are back and and performing again. And how old is this theater? Do you know? It was opened in 1928. Oh, so they've seen a lot of people come and go through that building. Yes. Yes, they have. And what did um, you find when you investigated then? The thing I remember is the the EVP that was captured out in the house when we were on the second floor. It sounded like a, a man talking. Um, and so we were, we were not in the house. So we were in the part of the theater. There's a concessions area kind of behind so there's a concessions area on the second floor and then the first floor of the theater and so we were on the second floor and we were sitting on the wall and to our right was the opening that went into the house we knew that the place was empty people anyways in that space in those spaces so we weren't sure exactly where where that was coming from so that was one experience and i guess piece of evidence that we captured from that location another major claim i that I probably should mention is on the third floor, there was a a worker who was in the third floor men's room and he was finishing up using the bathroom and was washing his hands. And then he saw a black shadow figure behind him in the mirror and he turned to look and he saw it run out the door to the room and then run and he followed it outside and it ran down the hallway. And then there's access to the house on the third floor as well. And it went into that access and he chased it in there because he thought it was a person. And third floor, just, you know, at that time, this was not during a show. It was he was someone who worked, um, you know, for like advertising for the the theaters. That's where offices were located on the third floor. And um, so this was during the day with when there wasn't a show going on. So he thought there was an intruder, basically. 
And when he chased it out into the the seats, the house, it just was gone. He didn't know where it went. Spent a lot of time on the third floor. And there's a, is there a third floor or fourth floor where the children's footsteps are heard. That's third floor, but down on the other side of the hallway from the yeah. bathroom. So so those are claims, not things that we experience, yeah. but things that we investigated. And that wraps up part one of our conversation with Noah Lee and Gravy of Paranormal Investigators of Milwaukee. In our next episode, we'll talk more about haunted locations in Milwaukee. Get more information about them, as well as read all about the evidence collected at various locations at paranormalmilwaukee.com. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advanced episodes, everything commercial free, become a Gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts. You can try it three days free or go to patreon.com slash the Grave Talks. You can find everything there. Also, all ad free. I'm Carol Hughes. And for all of us at the Grave Talks, thanks for listening. <laughs>